Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week, we talk with my friend and Liberty influencer, Julie Borowski. She's the author of a new children's book, Nobody Knows How to Make a Pizza. That's right, nobody. Check it out. Julie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are the author of this fantastic new book. I read the whole thing in one sitting. Nobody Knows How to Make a Pizza by Julie Borowski. And my gotcha question is, surely you know how to make a pizza, right? No, that's the whole point of the book. You don't don't, know how to make a pizza. I don't know how to milk a cow. I don't know how to make cheese. I don't know how to grow wheat. I don't know how to do any of those things. But you've made pizza. Yes, but I've had a lot, a lot of help from millions of people. Millions of people. Yes. Okay, so you are, uh, I guess I would call you a liberty influencer. Um, You're huge on social media. You're huge on YouTube. Uh, What do you call yourself? What's your deal? I'm just a person who posts my opinions on the internet. But you were, you like when when we worked together, you were like one of the first innovators, at least in my world, where you were posting funny videos, talking about liberty and, and, and engaging an audience outside of those of us that read Ludwig von Mises with reverence. Yeah, my whole point was trying to make these ideas more simple and more fun. So mm-hmm. I created a YouTube channel where I took all these Austrian economic stuff and posted in these silly two, three minute videos. So this is a, this is a continuation of that. You, yes. And you realize that most people on social media have the... Um, intellectual maturity of a five-year-old. I've noticed there's a lot of angry, angry people out there. Yeah. yeah. But there's nothing angry about this book. No. Tell, tell me what the deal is. You you published this just a couple weeks ago. And how's it going? Good. It's a very fun, positive book. So I got the inspiration through Leonard Reed's Eye Pencil, where he talks about how nobody knows how to make a pencil. It's a very simple thing, but there's millions and millions of people involved. Well, this is a great, fascinating story, but I thought, well, I want to make it even more kid-friendly, so I made it about pizza. And so far, it's gone great. A lot of parents say their kids love it. They see the pizza in the front, and they're really excited to read it, so it's it's going great. What's the what's the marketing strategy? It's all, all online, word of mouth? Social media, I've gotten endorsements. Rand Paul endorsed it, which is a pretty big deal for me. I was excited to get that one. That's a bucket list thing, right? Yeah. See, I said it. <laughs> I'll say it again. Um, who else has endorsed it? Uh, I was on the Tom Woods show. Jeffrey Tucker endorsed it. Robert Murphy. A bunch of big liberty influencers, as you say, would have endorsed it. But beyond that, it's really a book that any parent can read their child. I didn't want to make this just a libertarian book. Like, it has a broad appeal. Like, anyone can read it. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's no citation of, of Mises. I mean, you do acknowledge Leonard Reed, but... Uh... There's no, you don't use the word praxeology in here once. No, I didn't want it to be an ideology, a book. I want it just to be an educational book, and I think that's what it is. I've had teachers come to me and say they read it to the classroom, and it's no big deal because it is educational, fun, and positive. Yeah, it's it's contrarian, but it, it seems so obvious when you explain to people what it means that, that no one can make a pizza. So so give us the uh, give us the spoiler. Tell us tell us what what the what this what the end of the book is. The end of the book is that, that nobody knows how to make a pizza. It's kind of in the title there, but it talks about all the people involved in making a pizza, and it goes through some of them, the lady at the factory, the farmer, the person who delivers the tomatoes, people that you don't think. When you're eating a pizza, you think, oh, the chef made this in five minutes, but no, actually it's a very, very complicated process that no one person or central planner can manage. All these people come together voluntarily and make this amazing pizza. It's... Um you know, Leonard Reed was sort of a um, gateway for me. I, I went to I went to Grove City College, and I ended up going to the Foundation for Economic Education right after he had passed away. And the first thing you read is I pencil, and it what's what's so radical about that essay is that it was it was simple and common sense, and and really intended like your book. It's intended to reach people who don't they don't care about philosophy or economics. They're just people trying to figure stuff out 
And he was the guy, I think the first guy in America that said, let's take all these academic ideas of Hayek and Mises and that kind of thing, and let's translate them. Um, you're sort of one of the, you're one of the products of that, of that project. I don't even know if you knew that when you were going to college or something, but you, you're sort of one of Leonard Reed's kids, if you will. I suppose, because I first read iPencil when I was 20. I was going to Institute for Humane Studies seminar back in the day, and that was one of the things they told us to read, and I had never read it. I agreed already with the ideas, but I was like, wow, this is so simple and profound. This yeah. is amazing. It's both uh, Adam Smith's Invisible Hand and Frederick Hayek's understanding of sort of spontaneous order. We talk a lot about Hayek on this show, and even though we're talking about a children's book, you should know that um, devout, viewers of this podcast um, drink they chug a beer every time I quote Hayek so I have to do that is that's okay though right yeah go for it by the way beer is my metaphor okay um, um, because uh, and we've done a lot of videos about beer maybe maybe not as child friendly as pizza but um, we have been obsessed by the fact that you can't buy a beer in beer in Venezuela anymore and yet in the United States, you have this incredible uh, diversity of styles and, and flavors. And, and it's that same magic. Like, I suppose nobody can make a beer. And, and Venezuela approved that because they, they, they cut off the, the process by which you would get all of that, that local knowledge and products and to come into one place. That's cool. I mean, to me, it all tastes like pee, to be honest with you. Oh. <laughs> so. Okay, this interview is over. <laughs> Bye. So you don't like beer? No, uh, sorry, but I like pizza. Okay, that's well, my metaphor. I guess I guess that's why markets work is you, yeah. you don't have to like beer, and I don't have to like pizza. So what kind of pizza do you like? My favorite pizza is actually white pizza, and I get attacked by people saying that's very simple, but it tastes good. Why ruin it? Is white pizza real pizza? Yes, to me it is. To you it is. Yeah. Um, is it real pizza? Yeah, yeah, we real. we have an Italian on set, so. I like the white pie. Um, like if I went to to Naples, would I get a white pizza? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Rome has a white pie. That's really good. So you've you've been at this this game for a while, and and now you're you're talking to moms and and their kids. But um, the the overall environment are, are you positive or negative? Because if if you spend too much time on social media, like I do, you might walk away with the impression that that things are going to hell in a handbasket and that nobody gets liberty anymore and that, that um, sort of this, this, this strange new authoritarianism is, is rising up. Um, what's, your, what's your take and, and, and how, do we, how do we make sure the good guys keep moving in the right direction? Uh, social media can be very, very bad for your mental health. I know this personally. Uh, new Fear sells. So all these news people, even Twitter people, they're talking about fear and trying to scare the crap out of you into giving more government control. But when you look at it, by every measure, humans are doing better than ever before. We're the healthiest, wealthiest. This is the most peaceful time in human history. So I think focusing on that is really good for your mental health, and it's true. Also, this book, I've had a lot of parents come to me and say, you know, we need more stuff like this. And I think there's more books out there and more educational opportunities. So yes, you know, I know it can be hard to be positive, but I try to be positive on the outlook. My, my biggest um, dislike on social media is clickbait. I feel like clickbait is the bane of, of our human existence. And um, it's a little bit tougher to get to tell that positive story, isn't it? Like, do you get a lot of clicks saying, by the way, guys, everything's okay. Exactly. Fewer people are poor. More, fewer people are, are starving. More people have more opportunities. And that's sort of in the trajectory from, from the Industrial Revolution is, is, is quite profound. But people don't really believe that, do they? It's hard because sensationalism and fear, all that sells very well. Even for me, I know if I put out a negative video, it's going to get a lot more clicks than a positive video. That's yeah. where I've tried to, over the past couple months, really focus on the positive because I think there's so much anxiety, especially among millennials, mm -hmm. depression and anxiety. People are so scared of climate change right now and we're all going to die in 12 years. And that's not the truth. So I'm really trying to change people's perspective because all this anxiety 
is really bad for our country. We see all these mass shootings and stuff. I think one of the reasons is news media selling us this anxiety instead of the true story. So I'm trying to change the change the narrative there. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and your your videos have always been funny, even when I've you're tried, even yeah. when you're picking on people. <laughs> mm. Um, so your, your book is for parents who want to teach, um, their kids about, I guess, I guess markets, I mean, markets and freedom and, and how it is that sort of magically people cooperate, but you're, you're kind of, you're kind of hacking the education system here, right? Because they're not going to learn about these things in, in grade school, are they? It depends. I I saw a picture on Twitter, an elementary school teacher was reading that book to the classroom. So my hope is that this book is great for homeschooling parents, but I also want to introduce it into the schools. I think this would be a perfect book to teach kids in school. So I think that's my hope Um, because not every parent can homeschool, unfortunately. Um, A lot of people, I went to public school. A lot of those kids are in public school. So I hope we can put this in public schools as well as homeschooling parents. You and I are both victims of public schooling, and, <laughs> and somehow we've survived. Yeah. So, so do you have a do you have a strategy for for reaching uh, teachers? Um, no, I don't right now. I hope maybe my followers, it's just out there, right? my followers, will say hey and introduce them to this book. Yeah. So, uh, direct to camera pitch to teachers right now. Yes. This book. Or the, if you have kids in public schools. Uh, you know, you can donate this book. You can buy it and donate it to any school. Nice. <laughs> nice. That, was, that was a hard sell. Yeah. So where where do you actually buy this book? It's on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, aren't you worried that Amazon will will stifle your your speech? Not so much. Um, the cool thing about it is that Amazon has this thing called um, the Kindle Publishing. I'm a self-published author. Anyone be- can become an author these days. I just uploaded this to their platform. They print it out. They ship it themselves, and I get a cut. It's amazing the opportunities that the Internet has provided. I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I can make a book and make it, make it to the Internet, and people buy it. It's truly amazing how much the, the world has changed because of it. You didn't need a publisher, and no. and you know, without a publisher, you also don't get the publisher taking the lion's share of the of the proceeds. Yeah, the stigma against self published authors has really gone down. I didn't want to get a publisher because I wanted to have control over this book. I wanted to have all the control over the illustrations and have the final say. So for me, that was really important. And I didn't need an agent. I had social media. I had followers. So this was, I kind of cut out the middleman and did it myself. So it's truly amazing how anyone can really do this. Yeah. I mean, that, that to me is why I'm optimistic about the future of ideas because you don't, you don't actually need a publisher's permission you don't need to get in the New York Times. You don't need to get on the nightly news. You can you can do what you've been doing your entire career, which is just self-publish, create your own YouTube channel, um, reach reach young people that way. And to me, it's it's virtually impossible to imagine that that the government or the teachers unions or or the intellectual elites, whoever they are, they they can't stop this process because because people are free and they have these tools. No, they can't. They can't stop me, Matt. No, you cannot be stopped. <laughs> no, I'm unstoppable. So you 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 name drop some Austrian economists, which is music to my ears. What's what's your personal story like? How on earth do you find um, ideas like like Mises and Austrian economics? Well, we go back to the internet. I was a weird kid who cared about politics, but it wasn't until I was about 15 I found the world's smallest political quiz online. Yeah. And you take it and see what your what they um your political affiliation is, and it said I was a libertarian. And at the time, I had no idea what the heck that was. Like that's weird. Is that like a super liberal or something? And I googled it, and it said people who want maximum freedom, both personal and economic freedom. And I was like, wait, that's me. And I found out they were anti-war too. And I was like, wow, these are capitalists against war. And I didn't know that was a possibility. I thought there was only two camps. So for me, that was just so eye-opening, and it was because of the internet that I found these ideas. Um, and you ended up going, um, you, you found an Austrian economics professor at Frostburg 
State? Yes. Is that right? Dr. William Anderson, he writes for the Mises Institute, but it's funny, at the time, I did not know he was a libertarian. He was my economics professor. Yeah. He was just teaching economics, and I didn't know that he was a Ron Paul supporter and everything, so it's kind of funny to find that out. Your origin, I was I was expecting you to tell a Ron Paul story, but the, the world's smallest political quiz it's it's published by the advocates of self-government and you can go to that website everyone should take this quiz because i think one of the things that happens is a lot of people that that sort of feel conservative um when they really get into it they they start to realize that that um too many wars and particularly sort of regime change wars that we libertarians complain about all the time um it's it's the same mistake that central planners and people that want to design social welfare programs and, and use government to lift people out of poverty, it's that same pretense, right? It's that same, how could you possibly know how to reorganize society in Afghanistan so that it's a vibrant democracy? Exactly. The Middle East is so complicated. Who, who could solve that issue? Yeah. There's so many unintended consequences when you get involved because we don't understand the culture. We don't understand how complex this is. It's all been a failure and it's been so costly and has cost lives both over there and U.S. troops have been killed. So it's, it's, it's nonsense, really. And yet it still goes on and on. Yes. Do you have any, do you have any optimism that, that we can get more people to care about the fact that we've been in Afghanistan 18 years? Well, I think Donald Trump um, has done a pretty good job because of Rand Paul mostly. I love that Rand Paul has Donald Trump's ear, so he talks more about non-interventionism. Um, I think Donald Trump is moving in that direction, which is a great thing to see. I mean, he fired John Bolton, which I was really happy about. He shouldn't have been fi hired in the first place, but I'm like, okay, okay, that's a win. Let's celebrate that. So I think he's moving in the right direction, and I hope he can get more Republicans on, on board and say, hey, this foreign policy is not working. It's too costly. This is not limited government whatsoever. Whatsoever. So I do have some hope there. So you just did a Greta video. Yes. I don't even know her last name, and I've tried not to engage in this conversation. Um, but what was your approach? Because I think um, I, I sort of look at the hypocrisy of both sides because when, when a young person says something we agree with, we sort of applaud and say, isn't that awesome? But then if a young person says something we disagree with, oh, she's being manipulated and exploited and all that. What's well, how did you do? You, how did you balance those two things? There is quite a double standard. Uh, people say, oh, young people shouldn't get involved unless I agree with them. Then that's awesome. And then they're really wise for their age and good for them. Uh, for me, the whole Greta thing, I try to not be mean spirited. I mean, she is a 16 year old girl. Uh, so I came at it from approach of she's been kind of fed lies. I feel like there's better solutions to climate change. One of the things I talked about in the video as Greta is nuclear power, which for me is just awesome. I've been looking at it into it. Bill, Gra Bill Gates has this thing where he's trying to make it both safe and clean and it's um, very affordable and efficient. And to me, that's a better solution than, hey, let's stop eating meat. Let's ban cars, all these kind of radical solutions that are going to reduce our quality of life when there's a much better solution solution that is zero carbon emissions and that's nuclear power I, I don't know where where Greta got all of this anxiety about the sort of a pop apocalyptic that's a hard word to say apocalyptic future um, but um, I was reminded I'm, I'm obsessed with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez we all are if we're on social media because you can't avoid it sort of like you can't avoid Donald Trump but she said she said one thing that that was both interesting and shocking uh, a couple months ago. She said, my generation, speaking of millennials, has never known prosperity. And I, don't, I think that's a fairly direct quote. And there is this sort of um, fundamental conflict between the fact that she, she clearly believes that. I, I have no doubt that she feels that that's true. And yet she's living in the most prosperous country at the most prosperous time in history and I, f I feel like Greta and, and all sorts of young people that, that apparently believe that the world is going to end in 12 years because of global warming, uh, how do we talk them off the ledge? 
That's absurd um, to me. I'm a big fan of genealogy, um, research my family history, and I love to look at my family from 100 years ago and seeing what they were going through and actually real, real hardships of true extreme poverty in the United States and realizing how they came in my life is completely different. Most millennials cannot fathom a poverty that existed 100 years ago in this country. We're, we keep getting richer. We keep getting more prosperous, more healthy. I mean, look at the facts instead of being scared by all this media that's going on through social media. Um, since you're selling your book, I'm going to sell my new T-shirt here. Uh, and it's it's sort of a friendly troll of AOC, uh, morally right and factually correct. Is that what it says? Yeah, <laughs> it does say that. Because another one of her famous quotes, I think it was she was being uh, interviewed by, um, who's the CNN guy? Anderson Cooper, and she essentially said it's more important to be morally right than factually correct. And you just made a fact-based argument as as to, I mean, all you have to do is look at the data and and realize that that uh, people are living longer and and they're more healthy and they're more prosperous, all of these things. But but she's going to make a moral argument and say um, people don't have economic dignity. And I'm obsessed with that phrase that she uses. Um, don't we need to make sort of values-based moral arguments? And I've, I kind of feel this is where your book goes. It's 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 about it's about creating this beautiful thing. It's not about economics at all, except that it's all about economics. Um, what do you think? That wasn't even a question. So, <laughs> so you're, you're like, I don't even know what to do with that. Okay, let me see. Um, no, basically, AOC and Greta have a very negative approach to life and negative output. And really, it's not that big of a deal, guys. If global, if climate change exists, we have free market solutions to the problem. We have, like I, like I said, nuclear power. Electric cars are getting better and more affordable. I read soon we're going to have electric power airplanes on one single battery. We can fly across the country. There's all these free market solutions to this problem. And instead of focus on the positive they're focusing on the negative the doom and gloom which is hurting everyone's mental health uh, that's not the way to go about it which is the point of your book yes nobody knows how to make a pizza available on amazon yes and it's 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 ultimately uh an explanation of 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 hayek's um you know when he was when he was debating the socialists the central planners he was trying to explain to them why you couldn't replace this very bottom-up spontaneous process with with some sort of top-down plan because the guy at the top or the guys and the ladies whoever it is they don't know enough they can't possibly know enough they can't capture the the millions and millions and millions of people with their personal knowledge of how to make one part of a pizza and don't, don't we need to apply that philosophy to energy because uh, yes nuclear is is clearly better option but there might be even something better around the corner and the problem with the new green deal is it centralizes it and takes away that innovation from some young person we don't even know who it is yet there that person's going to solve this problem yeah, we don't know the future, and we don't know what we don't know about the future, about the new inventions and innovation that's coming. Like, human progress is just absolutely amazing. This new technology that just blows my mind. They may go to Mars soon. Alien, uh, I don't even understand how. Like, all this stuff, and there's no one central planner who can control it. It's up to the people and to create new inventions, and all this stuff, is, I don't, it just blows my mind, Matt. Will we find aliens out there? I don't know. I thought they were Area 51, but then they moved them because of the people coming in. So, you know, one of my theories is that Mark Zuckerberg is in fact a a a lizard alien from another planet. You're going to get banned from Facebook. I've already I've said it once on the <laughs> show, and it hasn't. Well, maybe I've been shadow banned this whole time. I don't know, but uh, I I'm I'm going to stick with that opinion. Okay. Yeah, we're in America. <laughs> we can do that. So if, if we start with young people, um, and I'm thinking about, about like I've, I've been trying for most of my career to help people break up the education monopoly because you have, you have the system K through 12 and now the university system, it's, it's, a, it's a cartel 
It's, it's one size fits all. It's failing our kids. It's more and more expensive. And I always thought that we had to fix that in order to um, make sure that young people had, had access to, to ideas and, and, and the basic skills to, to get ahead in the world. But I don't think that anymore. I, I, think, I think we can hack the system from the outside because of, because of the technology that's allowing you to sell this book. I think we can do both. Like you mentioned, I have Dr. William Anderson was my economics professor. He was in the system, but we also have um, these books outside the system. I think parents, even if they can't homeschool, they can educate their kids at the house. So I think we can do both, and I think that's really more is better. So homeschooling and unschooling, these are, uh, are these growing trends in the U.S.? Do you know? I think so. I've, I, you know, I've heard that homeschooling like 30 years ago was kind of this wacky, you know, crazy, you know, super religious only thing. Now I've heard that a lot of parents who are not religious or, you know, just regular parents uh, are t- homeschooling their kids. So I think it really is growing in- into a more mainstream thing. I've also heard there's things like homeschooling co-ops to actually bring socialization to the kids. Um, so I think it is a growing movement. We have an unschooler on set here, so we have to give a shout I out did, to yeah. unschooling. Um, so, so let's let let's let's close with this. Um, I want to know what you're doing next, and you, and you alluded to this, and and the reason I wanted you on the show is that you've you've gone from sort of like Twitter warfare um, when you were younger. Yeah. To sort of walking away from that and focusing on on the positive, beautiful aspects of liberty, um, you've you've written this book. What's 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 your strategy to the extent you can share that with a competitor? Because I might I might steal it from you. I just frankly don't have time to be arguing with strangers online about stuff that doesn't really matter. Um, I wrote this book. I'm writing the second book now. Um, I'm going to be making more YouTube videos recently. I've come out with some, and I just want to focus on the positive and help people, and that's my thing. I want to have a positive influence on people. I don't want to just be trolling, even though that can be fun at times, but I actually want to make the world a better place. And so I think this book and my YouTube videos and this kind of the new attitude I have is going to help. Cool. Julie Borowski, nobody knows how to make a pizza. Um, we We should actually go get a pizza now. All right, let's do it. Thanks for doing this. All right. Thank you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.